Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about humans and our effect on the biosphere. First off, we need to talk about some of our resources, in particular soil resources. And in the previous video we talked about how soil was important. And really it, it, it's this mineral and nutrient rich portion of the soil called topsoil we really have to worry about. It's really good at absorbing and retaining moisture. It allows enough water to drain so it's not waterlogged. It's rich in organic matter. The nutrients are all there for these plants to be able to grow and have good root systems and produce very viable fruit for us. So when we talk about our effect on soil resources, we really have to understand that this topsoil is what's important. But what happens when we don't respect that topsoil? This is an example of soil erosion, which really is where soil is removed by wind or water. This particular example, example is the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. It was caused in part by the conversion of prairie land into cropland in ways that left the soil vulnerable to erosion. Let me explain how that worked. First off, your prairie land had natural grasses that had very, very wide branching and good root systems. Even when the grass itself wasn't there because of drought, the roots were still there and those roots would hold that soil. When people came out to settle that land and to farm that land, they got rid of the original grasses and they tilled it up to plant crops. Initially, it grew crops very well because this was very, very fertile soil. That topsoil was excellent. But as these bad farming practices continued, they were over-tilling the land. They were leaving it untilled through windstorms. And what ended up happening was, it, we still had a pretty big windstorm in the 1930s and it picked up a lot of this dirt. The thing about wind is that when it's moving, it's got some force to it. But if it's moving with a bunch of dirt, it literally acts like mobile sandpaper, pulling up more and more dirt until you see the picture on the left. We have a huge dust cloud coming at you, causing scenes like the picture on the right. Literally, you're burying things in dirt. The Dust Bowl was a tragedy of abuse of the soil resource, and it was an example of what we could do to harm the environment with respect to soil. Desertification is also another thing that happens. In this particular picture on the right, it's showing you where vulnerability is at. Those very hot, dry areas are where we, we really worry about desertification. And, and, of course, the process of turning good soil into what basically is, is soil that can't support life is the process of desertification. Uh, roughly 40% of the Earth's land is considered at risk for desertification. And this map just simply shows North America. But if we're not protecting the soil in these vulnerable regions, it makes it more and more likely that we're going to lose viable soil that we could use for agriculture. Agriculture is, of course, very important to us. But modern agricultural practices have enabled farmers to double world food production over the last 40 years particularly through monoculture, which is a practice of clearing large areas of land to plant a single highly productive crop year after year after year. It enables a lot of money to happen, but really it puts a huge drain on the environment itself. In particular, cotton is a very, very nutrient-needy plant. And in the South, farmers planted cotton year after year because of its profitability. And so when that cotton keeps getting planted year after year after year, the soil gets worse and worse and worse. And so some of these modern agriculture processes are not good for the environment. Much better ones are rotating different crops every other year. For instance, in Indiana, you'll see farmers very often rotate corn and soybeans. And soybeans actually help to replenish some of the resources because of the bacteria on their roots and the nitrogen cycle. They help replenish some of the nutrients for the corn. Over time, our agriculture has changed. When humans were hunter-gatherers, they didn't do much agriculture. They just collected things. But as we settled down and we grew plants in one location, we were growing on a small scale in little villages like this. It wasn't easy to have a huge effect on the environment. As we got larger and larger populations, we had more and more people working the fields. The fields got bigger and bigger, and it became very important to put nutrients back into the Then we get to this large-scale agriculture before the Green Revolution. That's where we have huge fields being planted, farmed, and we're really not paying much attention to the soil, and it really gets kind of used up. Finally, we have today's practice, where we use machinery and fossil fuel technology to take what would have been impossible levels of farming and make it quite feasible. This has ups and downs. It can be a positive to put fertilizer on the field and let that soil recharge using that unnatural method, but it also has negatives on the environment other than that. In the future, potentially, we could have agriculture move indoors. 
as we move towards more and more people in the cities, this could be a viable option to have readily available fruits and vegetables for consumption. Another resource that we have an effect on is forests. Deforestation is the loss of forests. Uh, this can happen in a lot of ways, and, and this particular picture is showing a tree being cut down on the Amazon. But this really isn't what deforestation looks like. Trees are cut in very large-scale areas, cutting down hundreds of trees, acres and acres at a time. And so this, this scene gives you a little bit better idea, but it doesn't quite accomplish it. So we should give you a better idea. We cut down a large area. We're going to burn it. This is going to be used for agriculture. This is exactly what they're doing right now in Brazil and in other areas dense with rainforest. The forest itself is their resource, and they're choosing to use it. But this really should give you an idea of what it looks like. This entire area should be green, but it isn't. It's being deforested. And to put it into perspective for you, if you look down at the bottom, there's a scale. Wabash, the city you live in, is the size of this zero. So in the last decade, we've literally cleared out areas of forest the size of Wabash County. With no problem, the city itself is the size of the zero. The county, if you stretch it out, would easily fit into the deforested area. As we continue to do this, Brazil itself is losing a natural resource, but it changes the environment and it harms not only the forest itself, but the organisms that would live there. It's taking away their habitat. You see this particular picture here, and you'll notice these very large stone heads. They were carved in another location and moved to here. And a lot of theories suggest they used logs to do that, and they rolled them along logs, but not really sure. But if you take a look, do you see any trees there? The Rapa Nui actually abused their resources of the forest so much that what ended up happening was they killed off all of their trees on the entire island. They had a huge population there when they had trees to support them. But they didn't have the foresight to protect their resources. And once those resources were gone, those trees were very important for them to be able to fish, which was their primary food source. Without the trees, they couldn't have boats. Without boats, they couldn't fish. Without fish, they couldn't support their population. And eventually it declined. The lesson of Papua Nui is, is an example of why we need to protect our resources. Water resources is another thing that's very important. If you look at this graph, you'll realize that 96.5% of our water on the earth is ocean water. And the problem with that is that we need fresh water and the ocean water has salt in it. If you break it down, we really have about 2.5% of the world's water that is fresh and we could use. Uh, the vast majority is stuck in polar ice caps, and a, but a good amount of it is groundwater. But here's the thing about that groundwater. If it's being generated over thousands of years, we can use it up faster than it can replenish. And so it's not an infinite source. As we continue to use it, we'll continue to deplete the amount that's there. Not using it in a sustainable way could have dramatic effects. Another thing we do to water is that we, we quite frankly, abuse the waterways. This particular picture shows you a wastewater plant, and you can see them dumping the water into there. There's a lot of complicated things that happen with that, but what really adds up is that multiple wastewater plants are dumping into the same rivers along the entirety of it and what you end up with is these excess nutrients that cause the actual waterway to die. If we look at the Mississippi River, it's actually one huge tributary for the large part, a large part of the United States. The Missouri, the Upper Mississippi, the Ohio River all flow into the Mississippi River. The thing is that all the nutrients from all these wastewater plants and all these fertilizers flow into there and they create this hypoxic zone. And that hypoxic zone is quite deadly because what that hypoxic zone doesn't have is oxygen. All of those nutrients get used up by little tiny microorganisms and those tiny microorganisms while using the resources use up all of the oxygen and then we have a state where shrimp, fish, sharks and, and other organisms that we rely on for our economy can't survive because there isn't enough oxygen there. If we continue and zoom in a little bit farther, this particular graph will show you the effect of that hypoxic zone. The red area is where life cannot exist. There are not fish. There are no shrimp. There's no organism there that uses gills because there's not enough oxygen in the water for them to be able to survive. This is the type of effect we can have on our water. And our water is important to us. If we switch and talk about air, smog is something that's, that is a problem in larger cities. It's a gray-brown haze formed from chemical reactions among pollutants. Um, but this smog is caused from all of the exhaust from cars, exhaust from industrial processes. And that exhaust 
damages air quality. You must breathe to exist. And since you must breathe, air quality is important to you. A major example of where that played a role was in Denora, Pennsylvania. They had a killer smog in 1948. It was five days long because that is temperature inversion. The picture on the right is not at night. The picture on the right is during the day. They had this temperature inversion, and they kept going and using their zinc works, their industrial plant that was in the town, and they ignored the signs. The first day, it was coughing irritation. By the time it rained and cleared everything out on day four of this five-day-long temperature inversion, 20 people were dead, and one-third to one-half of the 14,000 res residents were sickened. This was just needless pollution that was allowed to continue. Even a decade after the mortality rates in that area are higher because of this pollution. This is the effect we can have on our ecosystem. There are 7 billion humans on this planet. So many that no matter what we think, we really do have a major effect.